Okay, so Genesis 37, and uh, quite a horrible story, really, between, you know, conflict there between brethren and how uh, these 12, or how the, these uh, brethren were dealing with Joseph. And um, this is our first introduction, well, not, not the very first time we introduced to, to Joseph as a person, but this begins the story of Joseph, and really we're following now Joseph's story till the end of Genesis. But look at verse number 11, please. Genesis 37, verse 11, it says, And his brethren envied him. This whole chapter gives us a snapshot of what envy can do between brethren. Okay, And we have a story here of brothers, you know, uh, blood brothers, but I want to take the lesson, I want to take the spiritual lesson from that and apply that to the church because we're all brethren here, aren't we? We're all brothers and sisters in the Lord. And would it surprise you if I told you that there is envy between brethren? You know that in churches there is envy and it can cause strife as we see in the strife that was caused here in this chapter. Now, this, uh, this is recorded for us even in the New Testament. I'll just read it to you quickly. It says in Acts 7, 9, And the patriarchs, moved with envy, sold Joseph into Egypt, but God was with him. So what caused the brothers to sell Joseph as a slave to the Egyptians? Envy. Envy caused them to sell Joseph. I mean, how bad is that? Selling your own brother uh, to, to the world, to the Egyptians. It was envy that caused that. Proverbs 14 verse 30 says, A sound heart is the life of the flesh, but envy the rottenness of the bones. Envy the rottenness. Could you imagine your bones physically just rotting? Rotting away. You know, there are uh, sicknesses that affect the bones, you know, and that will cause you to have a lower lifespan. You know, that will cause you to have a lower quality of life. So too will envy. Envy can destroy the quality of your life, will cause you to have a shorter lifespan, as it were, you know. And so envy is a, a horrible sin. And we've all had envy in our hearts at some point in our lives. All, all of us at some point have experienced envy. And for me, I'm just thinking back to the times that I have had envy toward other people. It's been horrible. It's, just, it's, it's not nice. It's not, not, not a good feeling to have. You know, uh, you're thinking the worst of people. You're thinking, uh, you, how can you take advantage? You know, why is that person getting blessed? Why is that person getting honored? Why not me? You might be thinking. You say, well, I've never had those thoughts. Yeah, right. You know, envy is something we've all had, and it's horrible. It's horrible. But I can, I can honestly say, you know, uh, thanks to the Lord, it, it, this is a sin that I no longer really struggle with. It was something I struggled with a lot in my teenagers. You know, I, I would see. Uh, how my friends would, you know, their parents were not so strict. You know, their parents would allow them to go to the cinemas or whatever, right? My parents were a lot more strict or whatever. They're just a freedom that I'd see other people have and I would envy them. I would envy that. And yet now I can look back and be thankful for the upbringing that my parents did give me. But you know, envy is also, can also be reflected within the church. And so the title for the sermon tonight, or yeah, tonight is Envy in the Church. Envy in the Church. And so we want to take the lessons we see in this chapter and apply them to the brothers and sisters we have in this church. Look at verse number one. And Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. So in the previous chapter we had the generations of Esau. Now we have the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren. And the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and with the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now this is again our first proper introduction to Joseph. We see him here as a 17 year old uh, child. Now what's very unique and very special about Joseph is that he's the very, one of the very few, I think he might be the only one actually, when I think about I mean I can think of some other men but I can also see some of their failings. But he's like the only character besides the Lord Jesus Christ where we never see him commit any sins. Okay, we don't have any of his sins recorded for us in the Bible. Okay, it's not saying that he never sinned. Of course he sinned, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, of course. Okay? But, the, you know, the Lord never records his sins. Meaning this, this man, Joseph, lived a, a righteous life. He lived a life that was God-honoring, so honoring that God doesn't even re, you know, record his sins. And we've gone through some of the other patriarchs, some of the other great men in the Bible. We looked at Abraham, we looked at Isaac, we looked at Jacob, and every time we've seen some sins that they've committed. And yet with Joseph, there is never a single sin recorded for us in the Bible for him. And so I believe this is important, you know, so we can see his life in the next few chapters as we go through the rest of Genesis, and we can learn from Joseph. We can see a righteous man. We see a man who is godly, who is honorable, who has, who has integrity about himself, so we can learn from him 
as well. And the first thing I want you to notice there, what makes him a, a, a very productive, uh, a man of integrity, a godly man, is that at the age of 17 years old, is he playing the Xbox? Yeah, at 17, is he playing the PlayStation? Is he out there at the cinemas watching the latest movies? You know, what is he doing? Is he, is he buying a, a drum kit so he can, you know, pretend to be in some rock band? What's he doing with his life at seven? 17 is a child. I mean, I think back when I was 17, I was a kid. I had no idea what I was going to do with my life. I was wasting my life on nonsense. But what's Joseph doing? A godly young lad, he's looking after the, the sheep, right? He's feeding the flock. He's working hard at 17 years old. And you know what my desire is? My desire, especially when it comes to my sons, but even my daughter, is that 17, they're working hard. They're being productive. They're learning how to be skillful in, in whatever capacity. Of course, you know, my son's out there in the workplace, you know, even if it's a part-time job or something, something to get them to, to learn and educate. And I can look at Joseph and say, look at Joseph. You know, I want my sons to be like Joseph. And, you know, when it comes to my daughter, I want my daughters to learn how to be godly wives, godly ladies, so they can be a help to a man in the future. And so I think this is so important that a boy at 17 years old, you should be out of work. All right? You should be out work being productive with your time. And again, I think back to me being 17. I'm sure you can think back to you being 17. Man, we were kids, right? We didn't know what we were doing with our lives. I mean, I, anyway, that's how I feel, right? No direction at all. But we see, you know, Joseph, you know, a, a, a good lad working hard. And what does he do? He's working hard for his father's business. He sees his own brothers slacking off on the job. And so he comes and he brings out, the Bible says here, he brought his father, unto his father, their evil reports, right? His other brothers were slacking off on the job. His other brothers were not looking after the sheep as they, sh as they should be. And so he goes to dad and, and tells dad about the situation. He goes and tells dad of their evil report. Now it's not saying here that Joseph brought a false report, or rather that the brethren were doing evil. They weren't doing the job that was assigned to them, and he let his father know. And the first point that I want to bring to your attention when it comes to envy is, and you'll see soon, soon later, that the brethren here started to hate Joseph for, for, for just being honest. They hated Joseph for bringing this report about their productivity. And so the first point that I have about envy is that envy, and again, we want to take this in the context of the church, envy will make you hate the preacher, the preacher that comes with the reports, the preacher that comes and opens the Bible, opens the Word of God at you, and you might not even like what is being preached, Envy will cause you to hate the preacher, okay? And I'm not necessarily talking about the pastor myself, but any man, any man that gets behind this pulpit opens the Word of God, you know, if you have envy in your heart, you don't like what is being said, even though it's the truth. You know, Joseph came preaching the truth, and the brethren did not like him. It caused them to hate him, okay? Was the problem with Joseph? No, the problem was with those that had the evil reports, okay? And you've got to be careful in church because the preacher gets behind the pulpit, does a lot of work, does a lot of study to preach the truth, okay? And if you hate the truth or you speak bad of the preacher, that's envy in your heart. That's hatred that you have in the heart for the report that they're bringing from the Word of God, okay? Now, here's what's beautiful about preaching the Word of God is that I don't have to target any individuals. I don't, have to, I don't come here thinking, what does brother so-and-so need? What does sister so-and-so need? All I need to do is preach the Bible, and it's something we all need. It's going to hit someone somewhere, okay? <laughs> and maybe at different points in your life, it'll have a different effect on you because we're all growing, we're all developing. But what's beautiful about the Bible, it's a mirror. And the, and the mirror shows us our imperfections. The mirror shows us where we need to work. And so, brethren, do you think Joseph came with an evil report because he wanted to destroy his brethren? What did he do? Did he do what's right, do you think? Do you think he did what's right? And I'm just appealing to the, to the parents here. You know, let's say, you know, you have, you know, two children or more than two children and one child gets into drugs and alcohol and whatever, starts destroying their lives, looking up pornography or whatever, not doing their chores, you know, destroying themselves, and you don't even know about it. If you don't know about it, wouldn't you want one of your other children that finds out about it to come to you and tell you? to bring that evil report? Isn't that what you would want as a parent? Absolutely, right? Why? So you can destroy that, that uh, son that you have, or that's, that daughter? No. So you can correct them. So you can guide them. So you can see the, 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 the problems they have to, and then make them aware of that, correct them, chastise them if you have to, so they can be better people. So they can learn how to, you know, they can learn that, you know, sin has consequences. 
You know, there's chastisement, there's correction for sin so they can be better people. You know, Joseph is a good man. He brings the report to help his brothers. Not to be the, the snitch, you know. Not to be a gossiper. He's coming with the truth and he takes the truth to the one that has authority. He takes it to his father. He takes it to the employer. The employer is the one that's making them look after the sheep, right? He takes it to the right person. Notice what Joseph doesn't do. He doesn't go around spreading it to the whole world. What, does, you know, what doesn't Joseph do? He doesn't go to Facebook, does he? He doesn't go on YouTube and spread all, all rumors about this bad report of his brothers. No, he takes it to the proper authority. He takes it to his father. Okay? He means well. He's not trying to make people look bad. He wants to help his brethren. So he does the right thing. He takes it to the person in authority. And let me tell you children right now, if you know that your siblings are doing evil, they're doing wrong, okay, and, and when you find out, you're going to be thinking, should I bring this to mom and dad? Or, but if I bring it to mom and dad, my brother or sister will get angry at me. Okay, no, you take it. You be like Joseph. You take it to dad. Okay, you take it to the one in authority and let them know to help your siblings. Because if they're doing something wicked, they're doing something evil, and your parents don't know, how are they going to help them? Okay, you're not, you're not, uh, you know, you're not, you're not being a snitch. You know, you're not being a, a, a dobber. You know, you're, you're being, you're doing the right thing. You know, you're helping your brothers and sisters when you bring the wrong things they've done before the Lord, to, 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 the, to the one in authority there when it comes to um, the father. And look, as we keep going through this chapter, we'll see that um, Isaac will again send, I'm um, sorry, not Isaac, uh, Jacob will again send um, Joseph to give him another report of, of his brethren. And so, you know, we can see that Joseph was trusted to bring a true report, you know, and as a preacher, you know, if you're going to get behind the pulpit and, you, you know, if you have a desire to be a pastor, you have to make a decision. I have to bring a true report. You know, I need to preach what is true, even if it's evil. Even, you know, the word evil just means harmful. Even if it means it's going to step on someone's toes, even if it means it's going to rip someone's face, I still got to get behind the pulpit and preach it. Right? I got to bring an honest report. And that's what Joseph did. That's what the kind of person Joseph was. And I'd be lying to you, brethren, if I, if I said to you, I'd be lying if I said, you know, I've never second-guessed what I was going to preach because of the feelings of some in the church. You know, there are a few times that I have prepared a sermon, and I'm thinking, man, should I preach this because I know this might offend brother so-and-so, or this might offend sister so-and-so. Should I preach it? Well, if they're going to be in church, I guess they want me to preach the Bible. I'll preach it anyway, okay? And that's the attitude you've got to have. You know, you, we're all going to have feelings. We're all going to have these thoughts. But then you've got to say, no, I've got to bring what's true. I've got to bring what's honest. You know, I've got to bring the Word of God. And I love that about Joseph. He brings the evil report, even though he, he knows that this is going to cause conflict. People are going to look at him and, and think evil of him. They're going to envy his position before his father who brings the truth. You know, we use the term shooting the messenger, don't we? You know, shooting the messenger. The messenger that comes to bring the message, we like to shoot the messenger. We think that's going to make us feel better. That somehow if we discredit the messenger... That discredits the message. No, no. And some people like to do that because, you know, when the report about them is true, they're going to try to find a way to get out of that and try to dismiss the messenger, try to make them look bad, right? No, when it comes to the Bible, what's beautiful about the Bible is that it never changes. What's beautiful about the Bible is that it is timeless. And so, you know, if you find that you hate the preaching, I'm telling you, it's envy. Okay, it's envy. For whatever reason, there, there is envy in your heart about the messenger potentially but especially about the message okay because it's shining a mirror on yourself all right now again you know joseph did the right thing he didn't broadcast it to the world he took it to the one in authority look at genesis 37 verse 3 please it says now israel loved joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age and he made him a coat of many colors i kind of make jokes about this with my kids and my wife you know, the kids that I had in my 20s, I call them the children of my young age. And the kids that I had in my 30s, I call them children in my old age. Right? I took that from this principle here. But what we see here is that Israel was favoring Joseph. Right? He says here that he loved him more than all his children. Do you think that's a good thing? Do you think that's the right thing for a parent to do, to love one child more than the other? No, that's, that's favoritism. Okay? That's favoritism. And, and listen, if you're going to show favoritism toward one of your children, expect your siblings to have rivalry. Ex expect that to happen, okay? It's the wrong thing. We already covered, already preached on this. When, um, if you might, you might remember when um, uh, Isaac favored Esau and Rebekah favored um, Jacob. Remember that? Well, Jacob's doing the same thing. Now he's favoring Joseph. 
and it's causing conflict in between the siblings. And that's, a, that's a bad behavior from the parents. But just because Israel favored Joseph, was that Joseph's fault? Do you think, as a 17-year-old son? Just because his dad favored him, the dad was wrong. But is that Joseph's fault? No, but what happens here? Now, Joseph loved, Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. So he favors him, he buys him this coat, many colors, and when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him. That's they hated Joseph and could not speak peaceably unto him. Is it Joseph's fault? No. Okay. His dad just wanted to give him a gift, gave him a coat. We already had a look at this in previous chapters, how clothing was very expensive in those days. Not only is this a piece of clothing, but it's a clothing of many colors. And it's a clothing that is, you know, a higher quality or great workmanship, right? It requires more work to make a coat of many colors than just a standard color, of course. And so this just shows how the, how the father wanted to honor his son Joseph with his coats. But again, is it Joseph's fault? No. And the next thing that I want to talk about here, point number two, is that envy will make you hate the gifts that are given to others. Envy will make you hate gifts given to others. Okay, what's that about? Well, you know, the Bible says in James 1.17, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Brethren, how do you react when people in this church are blessed by God? How do you react when people in this church are given rich gifts by God? You know, do you have envy in your hearts for them? You know, do you turn around and say, well, why should they get that? Why can't I get that? You know? And what does it cause you to feel, you know? If someone is being blessed by God, you need to learn how to rejoice with that person, okay? And I know this is hard. I've seen this in church. Every church I've been in, there's envy. You know, people get a gift. People get recognized or something. And there's someone in church that doesn't like it. They think, what about others? What about me? Listen, learn. Those good gifts come from the Father of lights. God made the decision. When you start criticizing someone else for being blessed, when you start hating the fact that they've been gifted by God, you're saying to God, I don't like your decision, God. I don't think that was righteous. But instead, you're hating on your brother or sister. That's not right. Okay? It's not right. Even if you think it's unfair, who cares? God is the perfect judge. You know? Every decision God makes is 100% righteous and correct. And I like it when God makes a decision and I disagree. I like it. Why? Because then it shows me that I'm a failure. That I, you know, I have the carnal flesh. It shows me that, you know, I'm not exactly where I need to be with God and I need to get back in touch with God. I'm sure we can all reflect on times we thought things were unfair. But if God has allowed, if God has blessed others, learn to rejoice. God has looked down favorably on that brother or that sister. I don't care what their sins are. We all have sins. God has looked down and blessed them. Learn to be thankful. Learn to rejoice. First, um, if you, can you guys keep your finger there and go to 1 Corinthians 12? Go to 1 Corinthians 12, and I'll read to you from Romans 12, 15. You guys go to 1 Corinthians 12. I'll read to you from Romans 12, 15. The Bible says, Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. Now that's good. When, when someone's weeping, learn to weep with them. Learn to mourn for them, okay? And if someone's weeping and someone's mourning and that gives you joy, there's a problem in your heart. There's a problem with you, Okay? If someone's weeping in church, you need to learn how to weep with them. But here's the other thing. When they're rejoicing, learn how to rejoice with them. Be thankful with them for what they've earned. So look at 1 Corinthians 12, 25. 1 Corinthians 12, 25. I want to take this lesson to the church. It says that there should be no schism in the body. The body, of course, is the church. But that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it or one member be honored, look at that, honored, all the members rejoice with it. Man, if they're honored, if God looks down and blesses them with whatever, gifts, a new car, a bigger house, whatever, learn to rejoice with them. Say, but I don't have a house. Who cares? God has given that brother or sister a house. He's given them a new car. He's given them something that they can enjoy. Hey, be thankful that God is looking down on this church and learn to rejoice. And look at verse 27. Now ye are the body of Christ. And members in particular. You are the body of Christ. 
There ought to be unity in the body of Christ. And what's beautiful about being in the body is that when you have joy and you rejoice, you know, you can have others that rejoice with you because the world's not going to rejoice with the things you rejoice. But when you weep, you have others that can weep with you, that can pray with you. And, you know, I'm thankful. Uh, it's a bit off topic, but I'm thankful for those, you know, that, you know, we had some bad news last week about the pregnancy and, you know, we weeped a bit. And I'm, I'm thankful for those that have weeped with us. I'm thankful for those that have prayed for us. You know, it's strengthened me. You know, it's strengthened Christina. It's made me feel the love that we have in the church. And that's how it ought to be, okay? Not just to me as the pastor, but one, one, one another, right? When we're all going through difficulties and struggles, Make sure you're praying for one another. You let them know that they're loved, that they're appreciated in the body of Christ. And so, you know, when the Lord blesses another believer, it is wicked to despise and envy them for their blessing. Again, the Lord is, is in, has His perfect judgment. Okay? He makes His perfect decisions. And uh, let's go back to Genesis 37, verse number 5. Genesis 37, verse 5. And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it his brethren. And they hated him yet the more. So Joseph has a dream. Again, is it his fault that he has a dream? In fact, this dream is given to Joseph by God. Okay? He has a dream. His brethren hate him about the dream. Verse number 6. And he said unto them, Here, I pray you, this dream which I have dreamed. Now look, I don't think Joseph is telling them this dream so they can envy him. I think he's honestly had this dream from God and wants to share it. Right? It's like when you prepare something for church, you know, to preach. You prepare something, well, I've got this from the Lord. You know, it's not about promoting yourself. It's about sharing the information with others that God has given. But what, what did he dream about? Verse number 7. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose, and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaves stood round about, and made obeisance to my sheaf. That's like bowing to the sheaf. And his brethren said unto him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us? Or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. Now look, I kind of understand this. I, I kind of do, right? Because I, I guess if they're thinking the worst, of, and this, this is the problem with envy, when you're already thinking the worst of somebody, anything they say or do, you're going to think there's an there's a ulterior motive behind it. You know, they're thinking what? You're going to stand, what? You're going to be above us? You're going to be in a higher authority than us? And they're thinking, what, Joseph, are you lifting yourself up? You're promoting yourself? Is that what's going on, Joseph? You think we're going to bow to you? You're the younger one. You're the youngest sibling that we have. Well, Benjamin was born already. But, you know, you're young compared to the rest of us. They're thinking the worst of Joseph. And yet, if you can please keep your finger there and go to Genesis 42. Genesis 42, what is this dream about? And, you know, we'll get to Genesis 42 eventually. But just for now, just as a reminder, Genesis 42 verse 5. Genesis 42 verse 5. This is the story when there's a, there's a famine in the land of Canaan and they're perishing, right? They need food, they need water. They go to, they, the, uh, the children of Israel decide to go to Egypt where there is food. Verse 5, And the sons of Israel came to buy corn among those that came, for the famine was in the land of Canaan. Look at this. And Joseph was the governor over the land, and he was that sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brethren came and bowed them bow down themselves before him with their faces to the earth. So what's this? This dream is a prophecy. This dream came true. Joseph's brother did bow themselves before him. But did they bow themselves before him because Joseph is trying to rule over them? What is this about? This is about a great famine that would come and that God would look after his family and he would use Joseph. He would use Joseph to save their lives, to give them the food they need. This isn't a dream for Joseph to be exalted. This is a dream saying, hey, I'm going to look after you. That's what's being promised by God. And that's Joseph's intention, right? Hey, looks like I'm going to be a help to you guys in some, some capacity, God is telling me. Go back to Genesis 37, verse, verse 9. And he dreamed yet another dream and told it his brethren and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. And he told it to his father and to his brethren. And his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee to the earth? What? You're going to have a higher authority than me, even, even me in the family, who's the patriarch of the family, right? 
I was the one that I was told to, I'm the prince that has the power of, with God and with men. Well, you're going to be in higher authority than me. And so the father rebukes him as well, right? And look at verse number 11. And his brother envied him, but his father observed the saying. So after Israel rebukes him, it says he's now observing the sale. You know, he realizes this is more than just a dream. This is more than Joseph. This isn't Joseph being prideful. There is a message behind this. And that's why he's observing the thing. He's thinking about what was being said there. I think Isaac realizes, I keep saying Isaac. I think Jacob realizes that this is a message from God. And you know, but there in verse number 11, again, it said, his brethren envied him. His brethren envied him. And Proverbs 27 verse 4 says this, Wrath is cruel and anger is outrageous. So we know that wrath and anger, when it's sinful, you know, it's, it's wicked, right? It, it, it takes up a lot of your nervous and emotional energy to have that wrath, to have that anger, and it can be uncontrollable sometimes, right? Wrath is cruel and anger is outrageous. But then it says this, but who is able to stand before envy? What's worse? Envy. Envy is worse than being full of wrath and full of anger, out of control. Who can stand before envy? Brethren, we need to overcome envy in our hearts. We need to overcome that sin because it's going to destroy our church. Okay, and I'm not saying it exists in our church. I'm just saying I, I hope it doesn't. I could, right? I'm preaching this. We're going through the chapters. I don't know, you know, but there could come a time in the future where you do have envy to the brethren in this church. And that will hurt you. That will hurt the brethren. And so this wasn't about Joseph trying to be lofty and prideful. No, what God was telling Joseph is that he would be promoted by the Lord. He would be promoted by the Lord. And God does that many times. He does promote people, right, for his purposes. And so the third point that I have here is that envy will make you despise others whom the Lord promotes. Envy will make you despise others whom the Lord promotes. And if you guys can turn to um, Psalm 75 for me, Psalm 75 verse 4, and again, I'm thinking about the context of the church here. But while you turn to Psalm 75, I'll read to you from Matthew 23, 11. It says, But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. And he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. I want to take the position or the, the church, right? The institution of the church. And I'm the pastor here, Right? I have a position of authority in this church. Oh, so prideful, so lofty. No, it says here that he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. You know, if you want to be promoted in the church, you know what that means? You've got to become a servant. You've got to serve more. You know, there was a time when I would just go to church with my wife and kids and I'd just sit there in the pew and I'd go home. No serving at all, all right? Did I have a position of authority? No, right? And you have the wicked... They believe that, they, you know, they want to lift themselves up. They want to make a name for themselves. And they think by becoming a pastor or becoming a leader in the church, that's going to fulfill their ambition and dreams. Well, actually, the, 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 <clears throat> the situation about the church is that the more you're lifted up by the Lord, the more the Lord promotes you, the more work you have to do, right? Instead of just coming to church and sitting in the pew and just singing songs of praise and going home, now I've got to put a lot of work before I come to church, right? Whereas before, I didn't have to think too much about it. I just would come to church. And I just want to, I just want to bring that to your remembrance because I'm not the only preacher here. You know, I allow others to get behind this pulpit and preach. And for those of you that get behind this pulpit and preach, you know what? You got promoted. For that brief service, for that service, you got promoted. You got behind the pulpit and we put you in a position of teaching you know, you're a teacher at that point in time. You're preaching the Word of God. You know, you're giving people the Word of God. Guess what that required? That required work, didn't it? That required you to prepare a sermon. That required you to study and to seek the Lord's wisdom so you can serve the church. You know, coming behind here is a position of service. We had Brother Tim song lead for us tonight. Guess what? He got promoted today. Promoted as a song leader. Okay? But what did he have to do? He had to get some hymns, work out, you know, trying his best to follow with the music and try to lead the congregation. It required some work. It required some service. You know, what's beautiful about the church, it's kind of like, you know, dealing with God, it's the, it's the reverse to the world. You know, you th in, the, in the world, you think if I take a position of authority, I'm getting served. 
But from, from God's perspective, no, you want a position of authority, you've got to serve more, all right? And then allow God to promote you in His time. You know, the Bible says in, where did I get to turn, sorry? Psalm 75, right? Verse 4, Psalm 75, verse 4. It said, I, I, I said unto the fools, deal not foolishly, and to the wicked, lift not up the horn. So what does the wicked want to do? They want to lift up their horn. They want to be exalted. Verse number 5, lift not up your horn on high. Speak not with a stiff neck. Verse 6, for promotion cometh neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. But God is the judge. He putteth down one and setteth up another. So where does promotion come from? It comes from the Lord. Okay? And back to the, you know, the example of this local church. When we have another brother come behind this pulpit and preach. Yes, I asked him to preach, but it's the Lord's doing. The Lord promoted him for that position right there to preach God's word. And the worst thing you can do is be envious and say, well, what about others? What about me? Why don't I get a chance to preach? Well, remember, that person getting behind the pulpit had to put the work in. He had to prepare. He probably spent more hours than you possibly can imagine. Right? He's probably getting behind his pulpit being more fearful because he knows he's trying to feed the people of God, the most important people that are on this planet, the children of God. What a great calling to be able to have that responsibility. But I've seen it. I've seen it, brethren, where someone gets behind the pulpit. I say, oh, not that brother. Oh, not him. Oh, what about me? I don't, how, you know, why does pastor allow him to preach? What, how come I haven't had my chance in a while? It's happened. It happens. I'm telling you, it happens. You know, I remember one of my old churches where, you know, I had, you know, I'm quite a friendly person, I hope, right? And I had, you know, two people that I would call friends, but they were in conflict and they didn't like each other. And they both would get opportunities to preach behind the pulpit. And then one day, you know, the one that was new, more newly saved, you know, he started to get it. He got it, you know, asked to preach behind the pulpit, you know, from the pastor. And he came behind the pulpit and started preaching. And then maybe a month later, he was asked, hey, what, can you come up again and preach one more time? Because he did a great job, right? And so he got behind the pulpit a second time. But then the other brother, who wasn't asked to preach, he wouldn't even stay in the church building, right? He, he went outside, and, and I, I went to talk to him afterwards, and he goes, oh, man, I can't believe pastor allowed him to preach again. What about me? I've been asking pastor for the last month and a half. You know, when can I preach? Now he's allowed him to preach again. And he couldn't even stand in the church. He couldn't even sit in the pew listening to the preaching. He had envy in his heart. Envy, okay? Instead of looking at, well, God promoted him. God promoted him. God has allowed him to preach and teach. Instead of thinking, well, how much work has he put in here? Hey, he's putting this work together for me, to serve me. Instead, he's thinking, well, you know, and look, I'm not, I'm not trying to attack him if you're listening to this sermon, you know. We all go through times of envy. We all go through this. And this is a sin that we need to overcome for the unity of the body of Christ. Be thankful to whoever gets behind this pulpit. You know, don't have the attitude, ah, oh, no, I, don't, I don't get much out of that person's sermon. I hope that doesn't happen here, okay? I hope it doesn't happen. I appreciate it. I appreciate it when I have other men get up behind this pulpit. I appreciate when ladies serve in the church, the Christmas decorations. I already said it, right? The morning tea, the clean, whatever, whatever people are doing for this church, I appreciate it. I love it. But here's the thing, if no one sees it, if no one says thank you, God sees it. Okay? God is laying up your rewards in heaven. Okay? Just remember that. Remember that. Because we don't have eyes everywhere. And we forget things. And I'm sure you've done things for me. And I'm sure I've forgotten to thank you. It's not because I'm unthankful. It's just I forgot. But be thankful that God saw. Be thankful that God saw what you've done. Okay? That's who we're coming here to serve. The Lord and to serve the brethren. And so envy will make you despise others whom the Lord promotes. And the greater example that I, I can think of here in the Bible is um, Barnabas. You know, when I was struggling with envy as a teenager, I went to church one day and I heard a sermon about Barnabas. And that kind of healed my envy, honestly. Because I started to think about Barnabas, I'm thinking, what a man, right? I mean, here's Barnabas, who's, who's, uh, who's got a name in the churches, and he goes to Saul, who was persecuting the church. No one wanted to touch Saul with a 10-foot pole. You know, except Barnabas. Barnabas was willing to give him the benefit of doubt. You know, Barnabas was willing to take him under the wing. You know, the Apostle Paul. You know, and, and he takes the Apostle Paul under his wing, and the Apostle Paul gets promoted. Right? He takes on the position of of a, of a um, apostle for Jesus Christ. Right? The Lord. You know, he's probably the greatest example of a Christian we can read about in the Bible. You know, the Lord used him to write the most New Testament books. 
What book did Barnabas write? But if not for Barnabas, we wouldn't have Paul. You know? And so Barnabas is the kind of guy that is able to take a believer under his wing, you know, who, who's, who's uh, younger than him in the faith, and he's able to work with him and help him get promoted. Right? Barnabas is able to rejoice in the promotion of others. Instead of saying, well, what about me, Lord? What about the books I didn't have to write? No, he was thankful for the work. And I know he was thankful for, for God promoting uh, Paul. Because then he had to deal with John Mark. Remember John Mark? Right? John Mark had disgraced himself a little bit. And yet Barnabas goes to John Mark and encourages him again, helps him get promoted, helps build him up once again. And then the Lord uses John Mark to write the book of Mark. Right. How good is that? And then it becomes profitable to Paul later on. Okay? He gets to work with one of the best Christians that we read about in the Bible. You know? All because of Barnabas. Now, we, don't, we don't see Barnabas with this huge name in the Bible, but God used him to help promote other people. And that's what's going to help you overcome envy. That's what, you know, um, just very quickly in my work, old workplace, you know, I, used, when I, I told you guys I used to have a lot of staff under me, and we had a high turnover area where we would lose a lot of staff to other companies, all right? Because the staff would say, well, you know, we don't get the opportunities to get promoted here. You know, I'm going to go and apply for another job. And I wanted to change that. And so... I just, I, I started to, uh, instead of getting annoyed at people leaving my work, you know, my department, I said, you know what, I'm going to help them leave. I'm going to help them get promote, promoted. And instead of leaving to another workplace, I want to get them promoted in this same workplace, just in another position, hopefully, you know. And that changed everything. And I would work with people, and they would get promoted, and I was happy for them. I enjoyed it. And here's the great thing about it, they were getting promoted in other places in the business. You know, I was looking after a call center. I had a lot of staff there. Again, a high turnover. But then when I started to work with them and help them get promoted, they would find themselves in other places in the same business. You know, I had my old employees in sales, my old employees in accounts, my old employees in marketing, you know, my old employees in, in, in products management or whatever, whatever positions they were. And all of a sudden, I had all this power in the, in the workplace. You know why? Because any department I would go to, there were people there that appreciated that I helped them get promoted. How good is that? It made my life a lot easier. You know, the, the manager that I had before me was always in conflict with the other departments in the business. Once I got in there, I got my people in other places, right? And all of a sudden, you know, I could call a favor when I needed it, right? Why? Because I helped promote other people. It made me feel good about myself. It gave me joy. When I saw them doing well, I started to rejoice for them because they were able to develop themselves, you know, and get themselves in prominent positions. And my desire is to promote you, you know, to help you grow as a Christian. If someone has a desire to be a pastor, my goal is to promote you to that position. Lord willing, if that's what God's will is for your life, we need to get you where you need to be then. You know, I'm, I'm willing to work with you to get you there, as well as the church down in Sydney. And we know that church needs a pastor. You know, where's it going to come from? I don't know just yet, all right? But we need to find people. We need to learn to encourage one another and promote them. Rather than criticizing them, rather than looking down, we all have sins, we all have weaknesses. But you can, you're able to overcome envy when you can learn how to love each other and promote them and, and you know, help them in the Lord. Back to Genesis 37, verse 12. Genesis 37, got a bit of a tangent there, sorry. Uh, Genesis 37, verse 12. It says, And his brethren went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. And Israel said unto Joseph, Do not thy brethren feed the flock in Shechem? Come, I will send thee unto them. And he said unto him, Here am I. And he said to him, Go, I pray thee, and whether it be well with thy brethren, and well with the flocks, and bring me word again. So you can see Israel trusts Joseph's report. Right? He's got a good report. So he sent him out of the vale of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. So once again, we see that confidence that Israel has. Verse 15, And a certain man found him, and behold, he was wandering in the field, and the man asked him, saying, What seekest thou? And he said, I seek my brethren. Tell me, I pray thee, where they feed their flocks. And the man said, They are departed hence. And I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. And Joseph went after his brethren and found them in Dothan. So you see the brethren aren't where they're supposed to be. Okay, Verse number 18. And when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. That means to kill him. His own brothers wanted to kill him. That's how much they envied him. Verse 19, And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh, and now therefore, and let us slay him, and cast him into some pits, and we will say, Some evil beast hath devoured him, 
and we shall see what will become of his dreams. Point number four is that envy will bring out the worst in you. The worst in you. Did you think these brothers would one day think about killing their own brother? You know, how wicked. Where did it start? It started with envy. Okay? This is why it's such a wicked sin. I hate it. I hate feeling that emotion. And when you're feeling envy, you better go to the Lord and say, Lord, help me. Help me overcome this sin. Lord, it's not right in my heart to have. And here's the thing about envy. For a brief moment, it makes you feel powerful. It makes you feel like, oh man, yeah, you know, I've got it in for that person. But really, it's just destroying. It's rottenness in your bones. Okay, it's wearing you down. And it's wearing out, you know, wearing down those that are around you. Look at verse 21. And Reuben heard it and he de- and <clears throat> and Reuben heard it and he de- li- sorry, and he delivered him out of their hands and said, Let us not kill him. And Reuben said unto them, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness, and lay no hand upon him, that he might rid him out of their hands to deliver him to his father again. And so Reuben is kind of playing along with this. Reuben doesn't want to slay him. He says, let's just chuck him in the pit there. And then he's going to kind of secretly take him and give him back to to his father, right? Reuben wanted to save Joseph's life. And he he does appease his brothers. Verse number 23. And he came to, I mean, it's still still a wicked thing, right? (laughs) Let's chuck our brother in in a pit. I mean, it's still extremely wicked. Verse 23. And it came to pass when Joseph was come unto his brethren, that they stripped Joseph out of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him. So they take that which was a gifted to him by his own father, and they took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty. There was no water in it. And they sat down to eat bread, and they lifted up their eyes and looked, and behold, a company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels bearing spicery and balm and myrrh, going to carry it down to Egypt. And Judah said unto his brethren, What profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh, and his brethren were content. So he says, look, instead of killing him, let's sell him. All right? I mean, it's, it's, they're both wicked things, right? But they're somehow satisfied by the second one, right? Let's sell him. I mean, it's horrible. Verse number 28. And there passed by Midianite merchantmen, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit, and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver, and they brought Joseph into Egypt. Now, before we read verse 29, Reuben, looks like when we look at this, Reuben wasn't there when they sold Joseph. I don't know where Reuben was. He wasn't there at this point in time. And, and so when you look at how many brethren there are, you know, they sold him for 20 pieces of silver, um, so if you remove Joseph, you remove Reuben from that equation, those that sold him would have got at least two pieces of silver each, you know, for selling Joseph. So they were able to profit from this. Verse 29, And Reuben returned unto the pit, and behold, Joseph was not in the pit, and he rent his clothes. Okay, And he returned unto his brethren and said, The child is not, and I, whither shall I go? And so the fifth point that I have here about envy is that envy will bring sorrow. Okay, envy will bring sorrow. Again, it makes you feel powerful for a brief moment. It does. You know, you're worked up about somebody else. Oh, what about that person? You know, and you feel powerful. You know, some of these sins are so wicked, like they're so deceiving. You know, you're, you're deceiving yourself. And what it does to Reuben, you know, the envy that the brethren would have, it caused him to just rip his clothes, rent his clothes, right? He's in mourning, he's in sorrow that his brother is not there. He's been sold and... Let's keep going. Verse number 31. But, you know, envy will bring sorrow to yourself, but also to others around you, you know, in this, you know, ch- other church members or even your own family. Verse 31. And they took Joseph's coat and killed a kid of the goats and dipped the coat in the, in the blood. And they sent the coat of many colors and they brought it to their father and said, This have we found. Now know whether it be thy son's coat or no. So they, they deceive in their father. They put this animal blood on the coat to make it look like he's been slain. And verse 33, And he, he knew it and said, It is my son's coat. An evil beast has devoured him. Kind of, right? I mean, his brother sold him, right? I mean, that's pretty evil. You know, but obviously he thinks an animal had killed him. Joseph is without doubt rent in pieces. And Jacob rents his clothes and put sackcloth upon his loins, and mourned for his son many days. And so, of course, this has an impact on Jacob, on the father. 
You know, look what envy does. You know, you're trying to just justify yourself. You know, you're trying to bring some justice that you think is going to help you in life, but it causes sorrow of those around you. And we see he had caused sorrow to the father. And look, it bothers the sons. It bothers the sons. Look at verse 35. And all his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him, the father that is. But he refused to be comforted. And he said, for I will go down into the grave unto my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him. He goes, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to die. Every, every day of my life till I die, I'm going to mourn for my son, Joseph, who's been killed. And this envy, this action because of envy, you, we'll read about it when we get there. This is something that stayed in the hearts of the brothers for years and years and years. The consequences of their actions because of their envy is something that they was just, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 a burden upon them for the rest of their lives. Not just them, but the father that they loved. You know, he's saying, look, every day I'm just going to mourn for my son. And, you know, he wasn't happy for the rest of his life. He wasn't happy. And well, until we get to the story where he's reunited with Joseph once again. But envy causes sorrow, okay? Sorrow for yourselves and for those that are around you, those that are affected by you. That's, those, that's the fifth point that I have. I'll be quick now. Verse number 36. And the Midianites sold him into Egypt unto Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh's and captain of the guards. So Joseph, Joseph gets sold into Egypt. And then we're going to continue his story, not, not this Sunday, but next Sunday. Um, but just once again, brethren, be careful of envy. I've struggled with envy in the past. I believe I've, you know, it's, 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 it's hard to say I believe I've overcome it. But I mean, I can tell from where I was before with this sin till today, it's not something that bothers me so much. I'm really thankful in general when people are blessed. And I, I, don't, I really don't envy people. I'm really thankful for the life that God has given me. You know, I, I, you know, counting your blessings can help you not to be envious, to know what God has done for your life. And then you can be thankful for what God has done for other people's life. But I can't turn around and say I will never experience that because we're all, we all have that sinful flesh, right? We all have that capacity. But let me just round it off one more time. The five uh, lessons about envy. Number one, envy will make you hate the preacher. Number two, envy will make you hate gifts that are given to others. Envy will make you despise others whom the Lord promotes. Um, envy will bring out the worst in you, and envy will bring sorrow. Let's pray.